Barry, what I, to start off with, I wanted to ask you, obviously, about Leighton Orient, obviously the football side of it. And how how did you get into that? Well, you know, football is a very strange and funny sport, as you know. Um, it seems to me that the first team you go to, you adopt as your own. And it's not for a week or a month. It's a lifetime. So yeah. I was 11, living on a council estate in East London, and I wanted to be a big boy and go and watch football. And all my mates were bragging at school. They went to West Ham and Arsenal and Tottenham. And my mum, my mum, who was my guiding influence in my life, said, that you can't go to a big club, you're not old enough, but you can go to Lake Orient because they're a friendly little club. I don't know if this is plugged in. Anyway, um, so I went when I was 11, immediately loved it, you know, um, watched probably shit football. They had a centre forward there called Tommy Johnson, who became my hero. I mean, he, he played with a bandaged wow. hand. He was an ex coal miner. And he was typical of the way I played football, which wasn't skillful at all, but it was very aggressive. Um, and he was like that. You know, those days, it wasn't just the ball that went in the back of the net. It was the goalkeeper, the right back, and the centre <laughs> off. <laughs> I've been in that situation well, a few I'm times. Sure you know, I mean, they've changed it now. I'm not saying it's, it's for girls, because that would be the wrong thing to say, but less, <laughs> less physical presences. So I went there, and, and I stayed there for two years. And then I went, I thought I'm ready to go to a, a big club. I went to Tottenham for the 61, 62 season, saw every no game, way. jumped on the pitch, collecting autographs, bumped into Stanley Matthews, got knocked over by Dave Mackay. So I was, I was a proper <laughs> football fan, but I never, ever forgot the Orient. So fast track, yeah. you know, 50, 50 odd years and I'd gone occasionally, I can't describe myself as a big football fan. I was too busy trying to make a living and doing other things. And I had a phone call from a, a guy uh, who owned Orion, who, who had a 50-50 joint venture in Rwanda with the government for coffee planter. His name was Tony Wood. He was a really nice man. And he bailed out Orion every year for years for about half a million quid a year. A lot of money in those days. Yeah. So, I mean, this is 25 years ago, 26 years ago. And he just came to see me and said, I know you used to be an Orient fan, but I have to say, I can't afford this club anymore. You know, they've torched my plantations, they've killed my staff, and I simply haven't got the money. And they, they were in debt. They couldn't pay their milk bill. And I, being an accountant, I looked at it and said, you're losing half a million quid a year. What do you, what do you want to give it to me for? I'm a, you know, I'm a proper businessman. I don't do things like that. And he said a very smart thing. He said, come and just come to the ground and have a look at the potential. Potential <laughs> is such a terrible word because his beauty is in the, in the eyes of the beholder. I went there and all I could think about was I used to stand behind that goal when I was, you know, 1959 I started there. And, I, and all of a sudden I started seeing the potential, which of course didn't exist really. <laughs> Next thing you know, I've told my chief, I came back, Steve Dawson's my, been my chief executive for 37 years now. And we've always said, don't get involved with football. And I come back, I went, we bought a football club. And he went, how much have we paid for it? I said, we're paying £2.43. And said, well, we had 243,000 shares and we gave them, you know, whatever, a penny a share. But of course, there was a couple of million quid of debt as well. That had to be paid as well. Oh, wow. and, but the moment you walk in the door, you've got to just imagine... Kid from Council House, this, like, this is a movie rather than a story. Kid from Council House, dad's a bus driver, mum's a child lady. I support a club when I'm 11 years old and I go back and buy the club. Is that not like <laughs> one of that to the world? You know? <laughs> <laughs> 19 years saying, why have I done this? <laughs> but over those 19 years, it gave me a lot of grief. It gave me four or five of my top 12 moments in my life which I shall never forget. And even when I sold the club, I made sure, just for old time's sake, I kept the ground. So at least I'm honorary. And the honorary president is lovely because I don't have to do anything. And secondly, I've got the ground, so I know that I can protect it, even though I don't have ownership. So it, it's a nice story with a nice ending. I go occasionally now. When I sold the club, I kept a table of 10 in the ballroom for the rest of my life. My grandchildren go there. My kids go there occasionally whenever we want. And we're Orient through and through. And that will never change no matter how many millions you've got. You don't forget your first club. 
Yeah. Well, that that you you, know, you just telling me that story now. It, that reminded me of when I went to my first ever game, and I was I was a Leeds fan. I've always been a Leeds fan, and I went to Rotherham because that's where I'm yeah. from. I went to Rotherham versus Leeds as a as a kid, and I remember going there with my dad, and I couldn't see over the fence. Obviously, I must have been very young, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm, I'm not grown that much. And I remember this 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 other a smaller guy. He got like this like orange wooden box, you know to stand on and he's like come here lad and stand on here with me and like and i'd like just looked up over the fence and i never forgot that and that the story you that you've just mentioned forget there because then you start forgetting who you are and where and yeah. where you've come from and then you start getting too yeah. big for your boots and totally obnoxious you know, you know. <laughs> and another <laughs> another person who has um never forgotten orient is Harry Kane, yeah, isn't no. it, Barry? I mean, oh, listen, he, he's done so much. But that was my... I mean, I'm going to take a lot of credit here. I found out Harry <laughs> as usual. And, and the great thing about me, by the way, because I'm so old, everything is the truth because I'm too close to God to lie. Right? <laughs> <laughs> That's a great one. Harry, I'm going to write that down I've, for I've always got years. a world with Harry. I think everybody does. He's one of life's better blokes. And I phoned him up one day and I said, Harry, I'm in the shit. We're bottom of the league and... Yeah, I don't look good, mate. Don't look good. I said, have you got anyone? Have you got anyone can help me out? And I had in mind some overseas player that, that wasn't getting picked in the first team. I said, what about such and such? He went, Barry, I like you too much to recommend him. He's rubbish, which I thought was really <laughs> honest of him. He said, well, I'll tell you what I'll do. I've got three kids that they'll actually will benefit from some proper football in a man's league. And it'll do them yeah. a lot of good. David, you know, that's so important, you know. Yeah. And oh, I yeah. said... Who are they? He said, well, it's Harry Kane, just just joined Tottenham. Uh, it was Carroll. I think he's... Yeah. Uh, Andy, Andy Carroll? Car- no, not Andy Carroll. No, oh. the guy that went on to be captain of Swansea. Tiny, little diminutive midfielder, but a really good, really good player. And some very yeah. quick winger, whose name completely escapes me, but he was like bloody lightning. And he said, you can have them <laughs> for 500 quid a week each. I thought, perfect. And of course, they changed the season, and it, would, yeah. it ended up being such a good season. You know, you do these things. I said, "Let's all go to Vegas for a party." You know, so I flew <laughs> off my way to Las Vegas, and all my blokes from Lake Norrie made a thorough disgrace of themselves. The, the winger wouldn't go because he said Las Vegas is a city of sin, and he was a pure Christian. And Harry Kane went with Carol, and they were in bed at half past ten. They'd been brought up the right way. You know, they lived the right life. They didn't get drunk. They did it. They were quite boring, really. <laughs> it shows you that from that day, they'd set their standards at a level beyond where my standards were, or my, my team standards. Yeah. Most of my youngsters arrived in Vegas with a fake ID so they could get into clubs. <laughs> you know, but, but Harry Kane was just lovely. He scored his first professional goal at Orient. And in a way, it's really nice. He's he sort of come back and he's put a little bit back in himself, you know, into Orient, had the shirt things and all that sort of stuff. And, and yeah. I think that's, you know, we have a family foundation and we put money into areas that have been good to us, like Sheffield for the snooker, Bristol for the home of the admin there, you know, Stoke, because a lot of darts players come from Stoke. And I think Harry, in that, in his own way, has done something for remembering where he come from, which shows that he remains a good lad with his feet on the ground. And I, and I remember, because quite honestly, when he played for us, I wouldn't have given him a prayer of ever being a proper footballer. He scored about three goals. He weren't rubbish. He just was a bit lightweight, you know. Uh, yeah. Of course, he's learned. Yeah. He's been very professional and he's become the legend that he has. And I'm very proud to think that we gave him his first start, you know. Was that Tom Carroll that you were Tom Carroll, about? yeah, good yeah. girl. Yeah. Well done. Yeah, he played the captain Swansea. He was a couple of inches too small for me to really like him, but he was extremely <laughs> he was extremely <laughs> able with the ball. But, you know, he was a class player. Not, but Barry, not, the fact that you remembered him, didn't yeah. he? I, I'm I'm just thinking he only had like about a season, didn't he? Yeah. It wasn't very long, was it, with you? Because no, no, he was no, a bit they of a journeyman. A, they all had a season on loan from One Harry. Season. And then they went back and they made their way. And they all made the first team. Um, the little winger, whose name I can't even pronounce, ended up at, I think, Andelect or something. Harry sold him for a few hundred thousand. He was he scored goals for fun. I mean, we were, yeah. we, I mean, looking at it now, it's just another chapter in 
the history of your favourite club. You know? <laughs> but have you have you ever had any any thoughts or inklings to get into any no, any no, other I'm club? A Lake Norris fan. I mean, I don't like football. Yeah. I like Lake Norris. You know, sometimes <laughs> the two go hand in hand. But they've done well. I mean, I sold them to a, a really crazy Italian for, as you'd expect, I took his trousers down a bit. Um, <laughs> I, wouldn't, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't have sold him the ground for any money because I didn't really trust him. And he ended up putting 15 million quid into players in Lake Norrin and managed to get us relegated twice in three years. It was almost an achievement to waste that amount of money that quickly. But they're now owned by a really nice group. Of, of, funny enough, a, a, a bloke I went to school with um, who became the president of Dunkin' Donuts uh, and Nigel Travis, oh. whose dad was a maniac or in sport into his 90s. Uh, you know, so the, the feeling of the club is still there. And then a few Americans, an ex-Microsoft guy, uh, that, that actually cared about community and all that. And they've, they've done super well. And we're back in Division One, terrible start. And now all of a sudden we're knocking on the playoff doors and everyone says it doesn't matter. They've got a plan, you know, consolidate this year and push next. Every, everyone has a plan in football. Unfortunately, football has its own plan for you. And, and it, it's not, yeah. <laughs> like most businesses, it's about management. The fans are the biggest problem because they've all got opinions and their opinions don't necessarily add up to their financial stature. Shall we put it that way? <laughs> <laughs> I, remember, I remember once, David, we had a meeting. I, I used to like integrating with the fans a lot. And we had a meeting one year called every, all the fans, Leighton Town Hall, about 900 turned up. And I was giving this talk about where we were going and what we were doing. And yeah, they were quite enthusiastic. And I said, I'll tell you what, I'm going to put another 350,000 quid in, into the club. And there's two things I can do with it. I said, I've negotiated the best deal ever with the council. I can buy the bloody ground. I don't like renting things. I've got too much money to rent things, don't you? <laughs> I said, I can buy the ground for 350 grand. It'd be ours forever. Or I can buy a new centre forward. I said, and I'm going to let no. you guys decide. So by a show of hands, <laughs> who wants to buy the ground? Who wants to buy the centre forward? All of them put their hand up. I said, oh. that's the reason why you people will never have a say in running a football club. <laughs> or you know, they were doing a double bluff and they knew you were going to buy the ground anyway. <laughs> no, I wish they were that intelligent. They certainly weren't. But the, kicker, <laughs> the kicker to it was is that I am very intelligent. I don't like to admit it because I'm shy and reclusive, as you know. But <laughs> 350 grand I paid for that ground. Within 18 months, I got planning permission for the four corners to be a flat development, 25% social housing for the community, 75% commercial. And I sold the land for eight and a half million. Oh, there you go. <laughs> oh, I put every go. penny back in the club and we built three sides of the ground with no borrowing. That's how you run small football club. Mm. Yes. Yeah. And if you, if you see, have you noticed like how he's bang on with his Absolutely. figures, right? So when... when when, when we go fishing, Barry writes down the weight of every single fish. In, and he's even got fish in his pond that he knows the exact weight they were when they went in and what they are I'm, now. And it's, it's just amazing. I'm a chartered accountant, obviously, and you know, I like numbers. But I'm also a bit of an anorak. And that's part of it, Dave, you know. I mean, yeah. I caught Ollie the other day in my lake. Now, Ollie has been in that lake since 2007. And I know that because he's my kitchen. And he's my <laughs> Where'd you microchip a fish? <laughs> and I have a scanner in my lodge. So as I catch them, I scan them. I know their name. I, I know their weight. I know their history. Ollie. Ollie's thinking, oh, not again. <laughs> Ollie, no, Ollie's a slapper. <laughs> Ollie is named after Ollie for Slipper, who you might know is the chairman of Pitch International, one of the biggest sports companies in this country. He's a personal friend of mine, and he's a director of the PDC, non-exec. He has been caught 57 times. <laughs> in 2007, he weighed one kilometre, oh, one kilometre, one kilogram, 0.17. Today, he weighs four kilograms, 0.65. And I always text Ollie when I catch him and say, call you again, you fat little bastard. <laughs> <laughs> He's clearly living the good life. <laughs> Brilliant. 
That's brilliant. Yeah, I mean, it's about what things matter, isn't it? You know, it's like, yeah. I haven't got any friends. Maybe I have to ring you up to go fishing, you know. <laughs> these are yeah. my friends. These fish are my friends. <laughs> Where did your love of fishing come from? My mum, when uh, when I was growing up, we, there wasn't a lot of, you know, I mean, funny enough, look back on it, I had a lovely, lovely childhood. I, and my mother was my driving force. My dad died very early. Uh, she was a wonderful in, in, inspiration to me. And she was the one that got me into everything. So she would come home and say, um, the local cricket club, Buckersteel, were doing nets, coaching for kids, go. And I'd walk three miles over the, you know, over the, the in those days, you'd let children, you wouldn't let children walk on their own today. But I'd go there and that's where I learned my cricket. And then she'd say to me, oh, by the way, I've enrolled you in the uh, elocution classes. Because she said, you speak very common. And my mum was a bit, she was a snob, really. She was a jar lady, but she was a snob. But she wanted the best for her kids. Mm. Yeah. Got standards. You know, and when I was 13, she enrolled me in the Amateur Dramatic Society. Do you know what that does? It teaches you how to fight. Because everyone takes the piss out of you. So you've got to learn to look after yourself. But I was doing yeah. Bertolt Breck and Shakespeare at 13. At 14, I was in the Verse Appreciation Society. I specialised in T.S. Eliot and I travelled around the country reciting poetry. This was all on my mum told me. Wow. So fishing, one day she said, "There's, you know, the river, the river Rodin runs down the back of our estate. She said, you should go out there with your mates fishing. I said, yeah, great. Well, as you fish, she gave me a tea towel. She said, you can go in the lake. She said, and then you take a tea towel each and you go under the reeds and come back and we might have a fish in it. And my fish the first year, I only ever used a tea towel. Oh, did you ever catch anything? Yeah, tiddlers, minnows. Snickle bats, snickle bats, oh. everything. Oh. Does, does, Ollie, does Ollie like the tea towel? Oh, man, no, I, love the tea. Well, I was dangerous with a tea towel, mate. I mean, I was... <laughs> <laughs> Don't you pick on me when I've got a tea towel in my hand. <laughs> That'll be our next bait, Barry. <laughs> <laughs> have that on the boat. <laughs> it's, it's very much a... Takes, it's an art yeah. form. You've got to learn it. David is much better than me at fishing. He's a proper fisherman, I've got to say. He's, to me, he's, yeah, he's, we, we, he's nearly pro standard, I think. We used to have fun, though, oh, mate. We have good fun. You know, that, that just, <laughs> never laugh so much. And when you, you know, it's always good yeah. when you find company that you can, you know, you can actually associate yeah, with. Exactly. And it's like, when we went fishing the other day, we, we play one, two, three, so there's three of us. And if you get a bite and you lose it, that's your go gone. If you get a bite and you catch a tiddler, that's your go-gone. And, and when, you, when it happens, the other two just fall about laughing because they know now you've got to wait until three fish come. Yeah. Do you ever do it with who, who wins? Like, not, not the amount of fish, but the weight of yeah, fish. Yeah, we do all the time. That's what we did last yeah. week. <laughs> yeah. But guess who won? Not you. <laughs> no. <laughs> Barry. <laughs> Yeah, but I've just been born. God decided to make me a lucky face, David. I don't have bad days. Don't have bad days. They're, for, they're for other people. No. It's all about... I'm, I'm going tomorrow. I'm fishing tomorrow at my, my oh, place yeah. at home. Um, yeah. Me and Jess, again, my, my nice. fall for the British heavyweight title, he's a great friend of mine, yeah. an avid fisherman. And we're starting, we might. start at 12 o'clock. <laughs> you like this story, young lady, I'm sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm not being sexist when I say that. But <laughs> you imagine this. 12 o'clock we start fishing. We fish until it's dark. We set the rods up with an automatic bait detector. We go inside. We have a couple of bottles of wine, as you do. Mm. And then I'm cooking tomorrow night lobster linguine. Right? Oh, I love Whoa. lobster linguine. That my is my favourite. I One know. Of my well, what are you doing tomorrow? Because we're all going to the <laughs> yeah. Yeah, We have a little cabin there. We sleep when we want to sleep. And as soon as it's dawn, we're up again. 10.30 is breakfast. And 12 o'clock, after 24 hours, we finish. And that's it. Lovely. You can't get a better day than that. You can't buy these type of days. I love no. it. What's on the menu for breakfast? Uh, you'd be surprised to know it's extremely traditional. Two, two fried eggs, of course. Yeah. Four rashers of bacon. bacon uh, baked beans and tin tomatoes with toast. And a cup of tea. Lovely. Oh. Can't beat that. <laughs> and brown sauce. I'll, I'll wait for my invite. I'll be there. Brown sauce. Oh, I'm brown sauce. HP, yeah. yeah, brown sauce. Oh, and by the way, just for the record, Barry Courtney, 11 pound, four ounce barbel, yeah. which was the day's best. Thank you so much. Of course, uh, the week before, I'd caught a 12 pound, 14, a 10 ounce barbel. I know. Yeah. We've never caught, I've never caught barbel that size. And, and the beauty of being, you know, obviously I do fishing events like Fishermania on Sky and things like that. We do the ITV stuff that David's been in as well. And, yeah. you know, so you, you get to meet 
I mean, I find these people so fascinating. Adam Rooney, that you know, we know, is like, From Drew, he's, like a, yeah. he's like a top pro. But I mean, you're guaranteed these guys could catch fish in a puddle, in a puddle. They're that know. good, you know. Uh, they are. Then, I mean, what what surprises me is that, like, when you when you're fishing, like in a river, and like we were on the River Trent, and it's a it's a big river. Yeah. And you're thinking like, oh, put big baits out, but no, they they're putting like little mm. baits out with this ground mm. bait on around it, and and they catch, and they're and like Barry says, we we always catch. We always we? we always catch. I mean, it's it's yeah. quite amazing. And when you say they look at the expanse of water, and you think, how many fish must be in, in there for some of them to recognise a bait that's no bigger than your thumbnail? Those ones yeah. that are doing that though, with a tiny bit of bait, they're not drinking the same wine that you guys are. <laughs> to be honest with you, I don't know anyone in my life. I mean, very few people do I know that get so much value out of life. Mm. Oh, yeah. And that's all about accepting certain things and, you know, perhaps set your bar a bit lower. But, oh, yeah. but the most important thing is you start and end the day with a smile on your face. And that, yeah. that's something that money just doesn't, you know, if, if you could buy it, trust me, I'd have already bought it. Mm. But you can't, you know, you have to create those moments. And most yeah. of it's not so much about the activity, it's about the company. Mm-hmm. And that's, yeah, that's beautiful, true. you know. It's only like going to watch it. You know, I went to watch Late Norin once. I'm sorry if I'm dallying you with old stories. There's an old bloke standing next to me and he's got a cloth cap on. Big lad. And I was nine, ten, no, I was 11. And he asked me what I was doing that night. And this is half time, the half time chat, you know. Got your bottle, yeah. that's it. <laughs> and I said, I'm going to the pictures with my mum and dad. He said, what are you going to see? I said, I'm going to see Cleopatra, one of those big Hollywood movies, you know, yeah. Elizabeth Taylor. And he said, oh, how interesting. He said, when you get to the end of the film, he said, because you know, in those days you play God Save the Queen and everyone stayed. Oh, my respect. gosh, I did not know this. Everyone. And you had to stand up and you sing God Save the Queen, then you left. But no one broke those rules. It's strange. Our life changes and people change. Yeah. He said, when that, and they play the credits, he said, watch the credits. He said, because my daughter is the costume director on that film in Hollywood. I'm like looking at yeah, this old geezer and say, he lives in Brisbane Road, Leighton. He's got a black <laughs> hat on. He's telling me some <laughs> shit about her. I said, what's her name? He said, her name is Edith Head. What? But I thought, why is he wasting his time telling an 11 year old kid this story? So at the end of the movie, I stood up and I watched the credits. Costume designer, Edith Head. And she became, if you check her out, the most famous costume designer ever in Hollywood. She's got her no name way. on the tablets of stone. She's been, you know, honored. <laughs> her dad lived in Brisbane Road and told me to no watch way. out for his daughter's name. That's brilliant. I mean, where did you get these things? <laughs> Who does it, you know? Yeah. But when I went to Tottenham, you know, we all used to collect autographs, didn't we, in those days? And I, I got John White's autograph six days before he got hit by lightning and killed. And I had everybody oh. apart from Dave Mackay. And I've gone to the watch and we're at home to Blackpool. Stanley Matthews is playing. And I, all I need is Dave Mackay's autograph. <laughs> the players are coming out. I'm off over the top, running on the pitch, on the tannoy. Will those boys get off the pitch? <laughs> and all I'm focusing on is Dave Mackay. He's my hero because he was a right hard man and he put yeah. his foot in Jesus. He didn't mess about. So I run towards him and he's come out of the tunnel with one of those big old heavy balls, David, with the leather and the, yeah, yeah. the rope in it. And he's kicked the goal, seriously, I don't tell lies, and he's hit me flush in the face. No and I'm on the floor. I'm laid out on the floor. My face is going, boing, boing. And Dave Mackay's leaned over and he's gone, are you all right, big Scottish dad? I can't do the accent. Oh, are you all right, son? I went, yes, Mr Mackay, I'm fine. Can I have your autograph? He's gone, no, you can fuck off. <laughs> anyway. Time passes, doesn't it? 25 years later, I'm doing some speech in the Midlands somewhere, some do, I can't remember. And someone said to me, oh, table over there from your era, Barry. It's old Tottenham players. 
There was a few there. One of them was Dave <laughs> Mackay. Oh. And I walked over to him and I went, can I have your autograph now? I've waited 30 years or 20 years. And we had a laugh about it. And we talked yeah. about the old days. I still didn't get his autograph. <laughs> <laughs> Did you see that story about Eden Hazard and the ball boy? Do you remember that incident with the ball boy with Eden Hazard? And that ball boy yeah. went on from Swansea to go and earn millions. There was a, there was an article about it recently. Yeah. I love those stories in football. Well, this has even got a better ending for me because three days later, this enormous package has arrived at my house and I've opened it and it's a picture of Dave Mackay, Jimmy Greaves... <laughs> Bill oh. Brown and Alan Galzine all signed with the 1962 FA Cup and a little note from Dave that said, now you've got my autograph. Oh, <laughs> wow, brilliant. That, that's in my, I have a private office, which is more like a tomb when you get to my own. <laughs> all my little <laughs> lovely moments, which make me cry, because I cry all the time, because I'm so happy. <laughs> this picture is in the centre of everything that's happened in my life. As one of my most treasured possessions.